All right, let's get right into it. Your assigned problems may or may not have different randomized values. For best results, attempt the assignment on your own before watching these solutions. Students are encouraged to frequently pause the video to work out steps on their own before proceeding with the solutions. And here's the list of topics to be covered in this video. For problem one, let's suppose f of x equals 7x minus 10, a is equal to negative 1, and b is equal to 2. First, we're asked to compute f of a plus f of b. Well, f of a is equal to f of negative 1, since a is equal to negative 1. We compute f of x equals 7x minus 10, so f of negative 1 is 7 times negative 1 minus 10, which resolves to negative 17. Similarly, since b is equal to 2, f of b is equal to f of 2, which is 7 times 2 minus 10, which computes down to 4. So we've computed that f of a is equal to negative 17 and f of b is equal to 4. Therefore, f of a plus f of b is simply negative 17 plus 4, which is equal to negative 13. Second, we're asked to compute f of a minus f of b, but we've already computed f of a equals negative 17 and f of b equals 4. So f of a minus f of b is simply negative 17 minus 4, which is equal to negative 21. For problem two, the function f of x is given by the graph below. Use the graph of f of x to answer the following questions. First, what is f of two? So here we are setting x equal to two. So here's the vertical line, x equals two. We're going to look for where this line intersects the graph of our function. It seems to intersect the graph at this point right here. The coordinate of this point is zero. Therefore, f of two is equal to zero. Next, we are asked to determine the x value so that f of x is equal to 3. Observe now that 3 is a y value, so let's put the horizontal line y equals 3 up on the graph and ask where does it intersect the graph at this point right here. The x coordinate of this point is negative 1, and therefore, when f of x is equal to 3, x must be equal to negative 1. In problem three, we're asked to graph an example for each type of slope listed below. First, a line with zero slope. Well, that just means a horizontal line. So here's an example of a horizontal line, but this result is certainly not unique. Any horizontal line would do. You could move it up, down, whatever. As long as it remained horizontal, it would be perfectly correct. Next, a line of positive slope, meaning an increasing line. As we move from left to right, the line should go up. So it could do something like this. But again, this is not a unique solution. Anything that goes up from left to right will be perfectly fine. Anything like this, totally great. Third, we're asked to draw a line with undefined slope, meaning a vertical line. Here's an example, but again, any vertical line will do, so it could move left or right as long as it remains perfectly vertical. And finally, a line of negative slope, meaning decreasing as we move from left to right, so something like this. And just like in part B, not a unique solution, anything that goes down from left to right would be perfectly fine, so it could move around kind of like this. These would all be perfectly good solutions. For problem four, match each of the following with the definition or description it demonstrates. So here's a list of terms, domain, range, y-intercept, slope-intercept form, standard form, and parallel lines, and we have to match these up to being the same slope, having opposite reciprocal slope, the equation y equals mx plus b, the equation ax plus by equals c, the y values of a function, or where the line crosses the y-axis, or finally, the x values of a function. Well, the domain of a function is what can be input into that function, which corresponds to the x values g. The range of a function in contrast is what you get out. In other words, the y values of a function e. The y-intercept is the point on the graph when x is equal to zero. That's exactly f where the line crosses the y-axis. The y-axis has equation x equals zero. Slope-intercept form is one particular way to write a line, and it's the form y equals mx plus b, in other words, item c. Similarly, standard form is simply a constant times x plus a constant times y equals another constant, which is exactly what was given in item d. And finally, parallel lines are lines which do not intersect, and algebraically you can work this out that it means they have the same slope, that's item a. Next problem five, we have a graph that has five lines drawn on it, and we're going to have to match them to the various equations, y equals negative x, y equals one half x, y equals negative three, y equals three x plus four, and y equals negative one half x plus four. 
Now we could plug various points into these various equations and see which lines go through that point, but that is not necessary, it is too much work. Rather, let's check is the slope of the line positive, negative, or zero, and is the y-intercept positive, negative, or zero. That will be enough information because of the way the lines are presented to determine which is which. First, we have a line with negative slope because we have negative one times x and zero intercept. If we plugged in x equals zero, we would get out y equals zero. So of all the lines drawn, which one has negative slope is going down left to right and goes through the point zero, zero? That's only the green line. Next, we have a line with positive slope, positive one half x, but still zero intercept. That must be the purple line. Third, we have a line with zero slope. We have a zero x present and we have a negative intercept. If x was equal to zero, y would still be negative three. There's only one line that has zero slope regardless of intercept and that's the red one. Fourth, we have y equals three x plus four. We have positive three x, AKA positive slope. And we have a positive intercept. If x was zero, then y would be equal to positive four. So of all the lines shown, which one is going up and does have y intercept four? That's the blue line. And finally, we have a negative slope line, negative one half x, but still a positive intercept, that's the black line. Problem six, we're gonna to have to match the given slopes to their correct representation. We have five quite different ways of representing lines given, and we have to identify which has slope zero, for which is the slope undefined, for which is the slope eight over five, for which is it two over three, and for which is it negative four. So let's go through the representations, A, B, C, D, E, one by one. Well, in the first graph, A, we have a horizontal line. That means it's constant, its slope is zero, so that's got to be capital A. For B, we have a line that goes over three units while going down 12. In other words, delta Y is negative 12 because Y has gone down by 12, while delta X is equal to three. So the slope delta Y over delta X computes to negative four. That's the last option, capital E. In the upper right, little c, we have a line that passes through two distinct and given points. So we're going to compute delta X to be the difference of the two X coordinates. The first X coordinate is negative five. The second is negative two. Negative five minus negative two is negative three. Similarly, delta y, the first minus the second, computes to be negative two. And then we compute the slope to be delta y over delta x, which is two thirds. That's capital D over on the left. Now in the bottom right, we have this pretty typical graph. We can identify a couple of points on the graph pretty exactly. First, negative three, comma, negative four. And over here, we have the point two comma four. And now we're basically in option C. We have two points on a line, so we can compute the slope to be delta Y over delta X. We'll take delta Y to be four, the top value, minus negative four, the bottom one, and delta X to be two, the top value, minus negative three, the bottom one. That computes to eight over five, which is option capital C over on the left. Now, finally, we have this chart where we have the same x value presented over and over again. In other words, if we pick two points on the line, we're going to get delta x equals zero. The difference between any two of these x coordinates will always just be zero. So if we attempt to compute the slope delta y over delta x, we'll be attempting to divide by zero, and that is undefined. For problem seven, we have a word problem. The pitch of a roof is its slope. Use the picture below to calculate the pitch of the roof. Assume the peak of the roof is in the center and the roof is symmetric. I'd point out that pitch is a technical term in roofing and it's not quite the slope of a line because it won't be negative. So we'll consider it to be the absolute value of the slope. Specifically, we have two segments of the roof here. They're going to have the same pitch, one positive and one negative. So we need to know the horizontal movement that corresponds to this given height of 20. Here's our delta y, 20. What's the corresponding delta x? Well, the whole width of the building is 76, and we were told that the roof is symmetric, meaning halfway there to get to the peak is exactly 38 feet, 76 divided by 2. So now we have our delta x of 38. So now we can simply compute that the slope is delta y over delta x, 20 over 38, which simplifies down to 10 over 19. In problem eight, find the slope of the line, which is supposed to be given as a reduced fraction or integer of the line that passes through two given points. Well, we're gonna do the same thing we've done several times now, delta y over delta x, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, the difference of the y coordinates divided by the difference of the x coordinates. 
So I'm simply choosing to take that second point first. It doesn't really matter as long as you are consistent in deciding which xy is first and which xy is second. So we compute negative 17 over 5 minus negative 1, the difference of the two y coordinates. We're going to divide it by 3 over 2 minus 15 over 2. So negative 17 over 5 plus 1, we're going to compute as plus 5 over 5 to give them a common denominator. And down in the bottom, we already have a common denominator, 3 over 2 minus 15 over 2. Well, now we have negative 12 over 5 over negative 12 over 2. Dividing by negative 12 over 2 is equivalent to multiplying by negative 2 over 12, reciprocating. The 12s cancel, the negatives cancel, and we simply get 2 fifths. There's our slope. Problem 9. Assuming the data in the given table represents points on the graph of a line, what's the value of n? Notice when x equals 3, we have y equals n, an unknown. So let's go row by row and see what is the delta x and what is the delta y. So going from the first to the second row, x has increased by 1, while y has increased by 9. If we move from the second to the third row, x increases by 1 and y increases by 9. And again, from the third to the fourth row, x increases by 1 and y increases by 9. Now we have our missing bit here, but x is still increasing by 1, meaning y must still be increasing by 9. This gives us the equation n minus 24 must be equal to 9, which we can pretty quickly solve to get n is equal to 33. We can now check if that's correct by going to the last line. Delta x is still 1, which means delta y should still be 9. And indeed, our computed value earlier of 33 is consistent. 42 minus 33 preserves that delta y is equal to 9 whenever delta x is equal to 1. For problem 10, we're given a linear equation, 5x plus 2y equals negative 20, and we're going to be asked a series of questions. We're supposed to make sure the answers are integers or, if necessary, reduced fractions. First, what's the vertical intercept? In other words, we need to solve for a y, and for intercepts, we let the other coordinate be 0, so we're going to let x equal 0. Well, in this case, 5 times 0 plus 2 times y must equal negative 20, meaning y must be equal to negative 10. Next, the horizontal intercept. Here we're solving for an x, so we're going to let y equal 0. So 5 times x plus 2 times 0 must equal negative 20, which we can solve for x equals minus 4. We're also asked to compute the slope. This is delta y over delta x, and we already have two points. We have x equals 0 means y equals negative 10, and we have x equals negative 4 means y equals 0. And with these two points, we can compute a delta y and a delta x and simplify this down to negative 5 over 2. Last, we're asked, write the equation of the line in slope-intercept form. Well, in part C, we computed a slope, and we have a vertical intercept in part A, so we have our m and our b for y equals mx plus b. So here's our slope, negative 5 halves. Our intercept was negative 10, so y is equal to negative 5 half x minus 10. Problem 11, we're given a graph. We have two lines, one decreasing, one increasing, labeled f and g respectively. And we're supposed to solve where is f of x less than g of x. The way we do this is by finding first where they are equal. Now two equations are equal where their graphs intersect, and it's at this point right here with coordinates 3 comma negative 3. So x is negative 3. There's our vertical line for x is equal to 3. f is getting smaller and g is getting bigger, and we are attempting to solve when is f less than g. So we found where they are equal, and f is getting smaller and g bigger as we move to the right, which means f of x will be less than g of x everywhere to the right of the point that we found. So in other words, when x is bigger than 3. Problem 12, a very similar problem to the last. We have two graphs given, f of x and g of x. Again, f is decreasing, g is increasing, and we are asked to solve where is f of x less than or equal to g of x. And again, we find where the two graphs cross, in other words, where they are equal, and we find it's at this point right here, x equals negative 1. So here's our vertical line, x equals negative 1. Now we want f of x to be less than or equal to g of x f is decreasing, g is increasing, we found where they are equal, which we are now including in our solution, which we were not in problem 11. So x being bigger than or equal to 3 will mean f of x is less than or equal to g of x. In problem 13, here's a graph of a function f of x. Let's solve some various inequalities. First, f of x is bigger than 10 if what? f of x is less than 10 if what, and f of x is equal to 10 if what, which isn't an inequality, but it fits in with the other pieces. 
So we find the point where f of x is equal to 10, and we see that it happens when x is equal to negative 3, right here. So here's our line, x is equal to negative 3. The graph is decreasing, so here's where it's equal to 10. Where is it bigger? It's bigger to the left, and it's smaller to the right. In other words, f of x is bigger than 10 if x is less than minus 3, f of x is less than 10 if x is bigger than minus 3, and we found the point where f of x equals 10 only when x equals negative 3. In problem 14, let's solve an algebraic inequality we no longer have a graph to look at. Negative 2 minus 5x is less than or equal to 4. So the solution as an inequality, all we do is add 2 to both sides, giving us negative 5x is less than or equal to 6. We can now divide by negative 5. Remember that when you multiply or divide an inequality by a negative number, you must flip the direction of the inequality. So observe we now have that x is bigger than or equal to negative 6 fifths. Part b, let's give the same solution as an interval. So we're looking at all of the x's bigger than or perhaps equal to negative 6 fifths. So we want an interval that starts at negative 6 fifths and includes it, and then everything bigger goes off to infinity, and we never include infinity with a square bracket in an interval. Problem 15, let's solve this inequality right here. Well, the first thing I'm going to want to do is expand out that multiplication on the left. So now we have 48x plus 20 is bigger than 2 minus 7x. We don't have to worry about flipping any inequalities here because we didn't multiply the entire expression by anything. We were just simplifying the left-hand side by itself. So now what we're going to do is add 7x to both sides to cancel it out on the right, giving us 55x plus 20 is larger than 2. We'll subtract 20 from both sides to cancel it out on the left, giving us 55x is bigger than negative 18. And now we can simply divide by 55, which is a positive number, so we do not need to reverse the inequality. x is bigger than negative 18 over 55. Here it is as an interval. We're looking for all of the x's to the right of negative 18 over 55, and that is a value we did not include, so we have open parentheses on both sides. Problem 16, we want to solve something. The answer, we're told, can be written in the form a less than x less than or equal to b. Here's our inequality. 0 is less than 3x minus 1 is less than or equal to 2. So our only x happens to be right in the middle, which is where we are told we want to have our only x. But remember that this sort of thing actually stands for two different inequalities. On the left, you have 0 is less than 3x minus 1, and on the right, you have 3x minus 1 is less than or equal to 2. It is possible to manipulate these simultaneously, but it can sometimes be tricky, so we're going to keep them separate. So on the left, we add 1 to both sides, and we do the same thing on the right. And then on both, we divide by 3. 3 being positive, we do not need to reverse the inequality. So the solution to this inequality is x is bigger than 1 third and x is less than or equal to 1. That's exactly the form we wanted, something less than x and x less than or equal to something. Here we have it, 1 third less than x, less than or equal to 1. Problem 17, we have the inequality 2x plus 4 is less than or equal to x plus 7 is less than or equal to 3x plus 8. We're told the interval of solution is going to look like closed brackets around a comma b, and we simply need to find those points. So this splits into two separate inequalities. On the left, 2x plus 4 is less than or equal to x plus 7, and on the right, x plus 7 is less than or equal to 3x plus 8, and attempting to solve both of these inequalities simultaneously would not quite work. On the left, if we subtract x and subtract 4 from both sides, we can isolate x. On the right, we have to subtract x, but we have to subtract 8 from both sides. So we are doing different manipulations to the two inequalities, which is why it is productive to split them apart. So on the one hand, we have x is less than or equal to 3, but also negative 1 is less than or equal to 2x. We're going to reverse uh, which one we're putting on the left versus the right just to preserve the typical order of inequalities that's something less than or equal to x less than or equal to something else because on the left we have negative 1 less than or equal to 2x which we're going to divide both sides by 2 and here we have it negative 1 half is less than or equal to x and also x is less than or equal to 3. That's the interval from negative 1 half to 3. One, negative 1 half is less than or equal to x. The equality accounts for the closed bracket and x is less than or equal to 3. For problem 18, 
It will take Rilla, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, 18 hours to knit a scarf. She can only knit for 1.5 hours today. We've all got other stuff to do, after all. How many days will it take her to knit the complete scarf? We don't actually have to solve this quite yet. In part one, we're told let x be the number of days it will take Rilla to knit the scarf, and we have to choose which of these equations is what we actually need to do to solve the question. A very productive way to do problems like this is to look at the units of the various quantities involved. The 1.5 is hours per day. It is how many hours per day Rilla could knit. The 18 was the 18 hours it will take her to knit the scarf, and x is days. So each of 1.5 and 18 and x has units attached to it, and we want to make sure that they are consistent on both sides of the equal sign. In part A, for example, on the left we have x, that's days. On the right we have 1.5, that's hours per day, and 18, which is hours. So on the left we have days, but on the right we would have square hours per day. Those are not the same thing. So this doesn't make any sense. In part B, we have 1.5, which was carrying the units of hours per day, times x, which is days, and on the right we have 18, which is hours. And on the left, observe that day and day will cancel, and we have hours equals hours totally consistent. So I think we have our answer, it's B, but let's just check that C doesn't make sense either. 18 carried the unit hours, 1.5 carried the unit hours per day, and X carried the unit days. You can't even do the subtraction on the left. They have different units. They can't be reasonably added and subtracted. It just doesn't make sense. So the only reasonable response is B. Now in part two, let's actually solve for x. Well, we've identified the correct equation is 1.5x equals 18. I prefer to work with fractions rather than decimals whenever possible, so 1.5 is 3 halves. So we have 3 halves x equals 18. We multiply both sides by 2 thirds. We can cancel the 3 out of the 18 and solve that x is 12, and we already know that the units on x is going to be days. Problem 19. When a new charter school opened in 1992, there were 290 students. Write a formula for the function n of t representing the number of students attending t years after 1992, assuming various things. First, suppose the student population increases by 20 per year. So the slope is 20. Every one unit of motion in the input, one year, corresponds to increasing by 20 in the output the number of students. So the slope, delta y over delta x, in this case delta n over delta t, is given to be 20, and it's positive because we are increasing. The intercept, what happens at t equals 0, we are told, is 290 students. So we're looking for a line that has slope 20 and intercept 290. In other words, n of t is 20t plus 290. For part B, what if the student population is decreasing by 36 students per year? Well, now our slope changes to negative 36. Our intercept remains the same at 290, so n of t is negative 36t plus 290. Third, what if the student population is increasing by 40 students, but it's doing so every two years? Now, the slope of the line should be how many students the population goes up every year. But 40 students over every two years means 20 students every year, and we still have an intercept of 290. This happens to be the same as part A. These problems are randomly generated. This is just a coincidence. Part D, what happens if the student population is decreasing by 44 students, but it's doing so every four years? Well, 44 students every four years means 11 students every year, but we're decreasing, so we have a negative slope. The intercept remains the same. N of t is negative 11t plus 290. And finally, what if the student population remains constant? Well, a constant function has zero slope, and we know the intercept is 290. In other words, N of t is simply always equal to 290. Problem 20. When you dive below the surface of the water, pressure increases. You can feel this in your ears as you dive to the bottom of a deep swimming pool. The function that describes this relationship is P of D is equal to 14.5 plus 29 over 66 times D. Excellent. We're mixing decimals and fractions. Always a great idea. Where D is the depth in feet below the surface and capital P is the pressure in pounds per square inch, aka PSI. A. What is the pressure at the surface and what are its units? Well, at the surface, the depth is zero, so we compute what is P of zero. We get 14.5 plus 29 over 66 times zero. This is 14.5, and we were simply told in the problem that the units of capital P are PSI, so 14.5 PSI. B, at what depth is the pressure exactly double the pressure that is at the surface, and what are its units? 
Well, we know we're looking for the pressure at a certain depth to be equal to twice the pressure at zero depth. We already know that at zero depth, the pressure is 14.5, and on the left-hand side, P of D is 14.5 plus 29 over 66 times D. So we have 29 over 66 times D should be equal to 2 times 14.5 minus 14.5. Well, if you have two apples and someone takes one away, you just have one apple. So the right-hand side is going to be 14.5, in other words, 29 over 2. So 29 over 66 times D is equal to 29 over 2. We multiply both sides by 66 over 29, and the 29s cancel. The problem was clearly designed to make this happen. The depth is 66 over 2, in other words, 33, and its units are feet. We were told in the statement of the problem that D is depth in feet. Next for part C, what is the pressure at a depth of 198 feet? Express in the form P of D equals Y is appropriate. Well, we're looking for a depth, so D equals 198. So Y should equal P of 198. If we plug in D equals 198, this is going to be 14.5 plus 29 over 66 times 198. Now 198 happens to be exactly 3 times 66, so we can cancel those 66s. We get 29 over 2 plus 29 times 3. This works out to be 203 over 2, and the units of a pressure are going to be PSI. Capital D, what is the pressure at a depth of 297 feet? Very similar to part C, all we have to do is plug in that D is equal to 297 and compute the result. 297 factors as 3 times 9 times 11, and 66 is 2 times 3 times 11, so we can cancel the 3 and the 11, but not the 2 this time. So we get 29 over 2 plus 29 times the remainder 9 in the numerator over 2, and we simplify all this down, it's exactly 145 PSI. Continuing still with the same problem, we are now given four graphs and asked which of the following could possibly be a graph of P of D. Well, P of D is 14.5 plus 29 over 66 times D. The slope is 29 over 66. That's positive. So we are looking for a graph with positive slope. Observe that A has zero slope, so it cannot possibly be the graph of P of D. And C has negative slope and cannot possibly be the graph of P of D. Items B and D both have positive slope, so I cannot quite rule one out yet. However, our function, the intercept is positive. The intercept is 14.5. And looking at option D on the right, we have a negative intercept, so that is not correct either. So the only possible answer is B. Problem 21. When purchasing a new cell phone plan, you are given two pay options. Both include unlimited texting, which is totally irrelevant to the problem, but thrown in for flavor, I suppose. Now with plan A, you can pay 29 cents per minute. Therefore, we can represent the cost, little c, to be 0.29 times m, where m represents the minutes used. But with plan B, you can instead pay a lower amount of cents per minute, 17 cents, but include a flat fee of exactly $12. So here your cost is 17 cents times the number of minutes, but plus an extra $12. First, let's write an inequality that represents plan B being less than plan A. Now, plan B was simply 0.17m plus 12, and plan A was 0.2m, so there we have it, plan B less than plan A. Hooray, we're done. Next, we are asked to solve this inequality. So if 0.17m plus 12 is supposed to be less than 0.2m, I'm going to go ahead and subtract 0.17m off of both sides. Now I can divide both sides by the 12 over 100 that 0.12 really represents. The 12s cancel and we get m is bigger than 100. The correct answer here now kind of depends on some particulars. We're asked to phrase it in the, in the way of saying plan B is less expensive than plan A when you use at least blank minutes. The best way to phrase your answer would be more than 100 minutes, but we are asked at least a blank number of minutes. Many phone plans, you should know, don't just measure in whole minutes. They, in fact, tend to measure, or used to when counting minutes mattered, in six-second increments. So you could really answer this with a fractional amount of minutes. So depending on exactly what's considered correct, I think the best answer is more than 100, but if you have to use the phrasing suggested of at least blank, they're probably looking for at least 101, because our solution was bigger than, but not including, 100. Problem 22. 
you have 776 decorative bricks delivered to your house and sit down in your driveway. Oh, otherwise known as last Tuesday. You need to move all of the bricks to your backyard. So you move a few bricks by hand, quickly decide that will take quite literally forever. So you go and buy a wheelbarrow to haul the rest. You decide to pace yourself by hauling seven wheelbarrows full of bricks each hour, a very specific number. After two hours, you determine you have moved 160 bricks to the backyard, and after seven hours, you find you have moved 545 bricks to the backyard. So having been so concerned about how long this was going to take that we drove somewhere to buy a wheelbarrow, we stop at two different points in time to count exactly how many bricks we've moved. I, I question the job foreman of this whole enterprise. But anyway, we're asked several things like how many bricks an hour are you moving using the wheelbarrow? And how many bricks have you moved by hand before you started using the wheelbarrow? Then we're going to be asked to write a linear function that represents this situation, where Q of T is MT plus B, Q standing for the quantity of bricks moved, and T being number of hours. Well, for part A, we know that at hour two, we have 160 bricks moved, and at hour seven, we have 545 bricks moved. In other words, we have two time coordinates, two and seven, and two quantity coordinates, 160 and 545. So delta T is five hours, and delta Q is 545 minus 160, which is 385 bricks. We can compute a slope of delta Q over delta T, 385 over five, which is 77 bricks per hour. In part B, how many bricks have you moved by hand? Well, we know at two hours we have moved 160 bricks. We know that our wheelbarrow is moving 77 bricks per hour. So in two hours, we would have moved two times 77 or 154 bricks. But we had 160 bricks and we've moved 154 by wheelbarrow, meaning the other six were done by hand. So we moved a total of six bricks by hand before giving up on that endeavor. Bravo to us. Part C, write a linear function. Well, we know the slope is 77 bricks per hour, and we know the intercept is six bricks. This was how many bricks were moved at time t equals zero. So we have a slope and we have an intercept. So Q of t is 77t plus six. Continuing with the same problem, I've simply copied that linear function we determined. Q of t is 77t plus six up to the top. We're gonna to keep going. Part D, find the value of t where q of t is 776, then write your answer as an ordered pair. Complete the sentence, after using the wheelbarrow for some number of hours, I will have moved all the bricks. 776, remember, was exactly how many bricks we have to move. So we are solving for the time t at which the quantity q is exactly 776. That's when we are done. We have moved all of the bricks. So Q of T, we want to be 776. We know Q of T should be of the form 77T plus six. So we subtract six from both sides, divide by 77, and we get T is equal to 10. So after using the wheelbarrow for 10 hours, I will have moved all the bricks to the backyard. Problem 23, we see the graph of a function. We are asked, determine the domain of the function in interval notation. Now the domain is what x values are allowed, and we see that x goes from negative three, but does not include that value as represented by the open dot on the line. And x can then move all the way to two and does include that as represented by the filled in dot. So we go from negative three to two. We do not include negative three, but we do include two. Presented as a compound inequality, we want negative 3 to be less than x, not equal, but x is less than or possibly equal to 2. Now we need to do the same thing with the range. So y can start down here at negative 3, but not include it, and y can go up to negative 1 and does include it. So we have a very similar looking interval, negative 3 to negative 1, and as a compound inequality, negative 3 is less than y, which is less than or equal to negative 1. Problem 24, let's sketch a graph of this piecewise defined function. When x is less than or equal to negative one, the function should be two. When x is between negative one and two, including two but not including negative one, then f of x should be negative x plus one. And when x is larger than two, f should simply be zero. Let's draw some vertical lines to represent these different pieces of the domain. Now we know that x equals minus one and x equals two are important cutoffs. So here we have them, x equals minus one and x equals two. The constant values are pretty easy to draw. We're gonna draw in constants at a height of two and zero, but only height two to the left, including negative one. So we do want to include that, but on the right where we have x larger than two, we do not include two at this constant height of zero. In between, we have this line. The intercept would be plus one, so we're gonna go ahead and put that point on there. 
and the slope is negative one. So as we move to the right one unit, we should move down one unit. And if we move left, we should move up. So going down, we would trace out this. That is every one unit of movement to the right is one unit down. And to the left, we would trace out something like this. One unit left gives one unit up. And with the line that we just filled out is exactly this one here. Again, we want to take care with what endpoints are or are not included. So on the left, we're actually not including the endpoint on the line, but it happens to be exactly the same point that was included with this constant. On the right, we are going to include it. Finally, at last, problem 25, give a formula for the function graphed below. And we see we have three different pieces shown here. Let's identify the pieces of the domain. We've got some important cutoffs at x equals negative 6, which is included, to x equals negative 1, which is included, then from x equals negative 1, which isn't, to x equals 3, which is, then on the rightmost piece, x equals 3, which is not included, to x equals 6, which is included. So the three pieces of our domain are from negative 6 to negative 1, including both, from negative 1 to 3, only including 3, and from 3 to 6, only including 6. The middle segment is constant. We see that it's just y equals 4. That's an easy one to go ahead and fill in. So here is our line y equals 4, exactly matching that constant. So we go ahead and put that in. f of x is 4 on this middle piece. The left is a line with slope 1. Okay, on the left, we can see that as we move right 1, we go up 1. As we move right 1, we go up 1. But if we were to continue, we might find that we have an intercept at a height of 6. The line doesn't actually contain its intercept, but if it did, it would have intercept 6. So it's a line of slope 1 with intercept 6. That means it has the form x plus 6. On the right, we have this other line here. We're going to compute its slope. We see that if we move right 1, then we move down by 2. So it has a slope of negative 2 over 1, or negative 2. Now we want to find its intercept. So as we move left, we're going to have to move up. So every one unit we move left, we go up by two units. So every three units we move left, it goes up an additional six units. And since it started at a height of three, it's going to go all the way up to a height of nine, which isn't quite included here. So it has slope negative two, and it has intercept nine. That's negative two x plus nine.